Okay, we're live on Facebook. Hi. <laughs> All right, great. So, um, so we're live. Yay. Let me, um, people are going to be joining us. So I'm just going to um, admit everyone who's waiting. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is Sheila Donahue and Vero. Vero. And Vero curates and sells small production wines and olive oils from small, sustainable, passionate producers around the world. And we sell them to wine stores, restaurants, and consumers across the United States. Our website is verovinogusto.com. And, um, and today, we're talking about Lambrusco and um, we're talking also about how Lambrusco has evolved uh, over the, let's say since the seventies to today. And um, we're talking to the, one of the, let's say latest generation um, uh, grower makers of Lambrusco. Uh, so we have with us Rafaela and Giuseppe of Buño Martino. Hello, hello. And, um, and we're really pleased to have Lenka Davis with us, Lenka Davis with us today. Lenka is a, a sommelier, a, a wine um, expert, uh, and particularly uh, knowledgeable and passionate about natural wine. And so she's going to be uh, exploring um, this topic with us today and tasting some of uh, Ibunia Martino's wines. So, um, uh, we want to uh, make this interactive. If you um, have any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and you know ask the question. Of course, uh, give us any feedback. I know some of you on the call do have some um, some of the Buño Martino wines as well. Um, and um, yeah, and I guess we'll I'll turn it over to Lenka. Thank you so much, Sheila, for the introduction. Um, hi, Rafaela and Giuseppe. Uh, first, tell me how you're doing at the moment. Um, in our communication before the talk, you mentioned a nightly curfew um, in your region. Yes, we are uh, in Italy and in precision, uh, we are in uh, Lombardy, that is uh, the, um, the region, uh, the most uh, uh, hit by uh, the coronavirus, so we have um, um, great restrictions for our movement. We have we we can go out just for work or uh, to to buy food. So uh, we we live in our home and uh, and for work. So it's a uh, it's a little bit hard, but uh, this is. Uh, this is the second time, so we are uh, uh, we are ready and we know how to approach <laughs> to this situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and what um, what a time to hunker down in your home with some Lambrusco uh, by your side. Um, so this is your first. Uh, sorry, this is your third vintage since you got your own cellar. Um, can you tell us how you got there? Um, how did the two of you get together? How did the Buño Martino project start? Um, Buño Martino is uh, a project of love, first of all, because uh, uh, Giuseppe and I fell in love uh, uh, 20 years ago. So uh, first of all, is a, is a love story. Um, my husband and me were so close uh, to the wine world uh, thanks to, to our passion. We had uh, our jobs in uh, different branches, but um, mm, the passion for love was really, really great. Uh, Giuseppe is for nature uh, deeply connected with uh, the sustainability of environment. And he studied, we studied a lot about um, wines and in particular uh, about organic and natural winemaking. 
And then it happened that Giovanni, uh, who is um, Giuseppe's father, um, had a, uh, is the owner of the old family farm uh, since it was created. And um, he retired. And we discovered that uh, the soil of uh, the old family farm was perfect for uh, uh, a natural um, for to, to build a winery with a natural and organic wine making philosophy. So um, we we planted 15 years ago uh, our first uh, vineyard. Um, then uh, we we planted the, the second one, and today we have nine hectare of Lambrusco vineyards inside our estate of 70 hectares. Um, a little more um, delving into the category of Lambrusco, um, just so our listeners um, and viewers can imagine how large the production is. Um, in 2013, it turned out, Lambrusco uh, turned out 165 million bottles um, under the DOC rules, and most of it actually has been made by co-ops and large producers. Um, and um, this in comparison to what Sheila just told me in the 70s and 80s, uh, one of the largest producers of Lambrusco um, produced uh, about 160 million bottles just by themselves. So the production numbers have slightly decreased. Um, there are many parallels uh, with industrial um, and artisanal Beaujolais and Lambrusco. Um, both of them uh, had the style that was so popular that it warranted production increase in the 70s and 80s. And that's when Lambrusco received the reputation of industrial wine. Uh, many people said, you know, it was close to soda in sweetness and flavors, but with alcohol. Um, the wines were marked by heavy intervention, uh, lots of filtration, stabilization. <laughs> Often the wines were pasteurized. Um, and the classic method was swapped for Charmat method in most cases. And even though this is still the reality in many co-ops and parts of the production, um, can you tell us about the artisanal movement in Alambrusco? Okay. Um, the most uh, of um, producer of artisanal Lambrusco um, are from Emilia Romagna. They were the first uh, to start to recover uh, the ancient traditions. And here in Mantova, the movement is uh, growing, but our area is uh, small uh, compared to Emilia Romagna. There are fewer producers in general. Um, the difference with um, conventional wine is that um, the artisan winemaker works uh, um, um, in a noble way. We pay a great attention to the land care. Uh, we must use manual processing. And uh, mm, in the cellar, we use only um, natural fermentation. And um, it's very important because the, wine, uh, the wines are really different. Um, in the past, uh, uh, Lambrusco plants have always been exploited for the great productions. Um, artisan winemakers, artisan Lambrusco winemakers, have uh, recognized the potentials of these plants. And uh, we discovered that if we respect uh, our vines, Lambrusco has nothing to envy to other wines. This is why uh, we. Um, I, I come back to, to your uh, previous uh, question. This is why we built um, our winery. Um, we, we had clearly uh, the idea in our mind of what type of Lambrusco we wanted to do. And only if you, if you follow all the um, all the processing and all the, um, the vinification and
and uh, all the production chain from the organic cultivation in the vineyard, uh, the low yields that allow to uh, minimize uh, the, um, the seller interventions. It's only in this way that you can produce artisan wine and it's only in this way that you can obtain the wine you want with the hand of the vigneron. So this is really important. Mm -hmm. Annabella, how do you see the future of this uh, artisanal movement of Lambrusco in the future? Uh, we are really proud that artisan Lambrusco uh, is increasing day by day. Uh, this type of wines are really different from uh, the conventional wines. And, uh, and we, are, we are very happy that they are really appreciated. So uh, I think that sometime we will arrive, um, we will arrive to be recognized as the true expression of Lambrusco. And even though uh, the number are much more fewer than conventional Lambrusco. Our mission is to um, return to Lambrusco its identity and the value it deserves. Um, Mantua Lambrusco has always been famous for having a higher quality than the others. Uh, there are young people approaching to the world of, of agriculture and the world of artisan Lambrusco. And this is a great hope for the future, for the artisan Lambrusco movement in general and for Mantuan Lambrusco. Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, um, let's, uh, let's spend some time in Mantova that you just um, started talking about. Um, our viewers can see the map of uh, Lambrusco production regions. Um, just for your orientation, um, most of uh, Lambrusco gets made actually not in Mantova uh, or Mantua, but uh, on the other side of the River Po. Um, uh, so how does, how does it look like in Mantova? Can you paint a picture of what you see around you if you're in the vineyard? Okay, uh, allora, mm, no. <laughs> let me explain where is, no, come back, Sheila, come back, please. I want to show you with the map, I want to explain with the map. Yeah. Um, you see the, you see, um, this is the map of all the area producing Lambrusco. So, uh, the upper part is uh, Mantova, which is a small village. Okay, the blue the blue zone is the um, the area in the south of the of the Po River, that is the longer uh, river in Italy, and the blue area is the area of Lambrusco Mant Mantuan Lambrusco production. So in Mantova and in Lombardy, we can produce Lambrusco just in this blue area. Then the area uh, under uh, the blue zone is Emilia Romagna, which is a great region. And everyone here produce Lambrusco, which is Emilian Lambrusco, okay? Uh, so we are the first village, San Benedetto Po is one of the most beautiful village in Italy, so we have a great story. And uh, we are the first village under the Po River, and we are on Padana Plain. Uh, we have alluvial soil that arise that where, um, where once there was the Po River bed. And likely, this, not, um, this doesn't mean that there is a prevalence of sand. Our soil ranging from clayey to less compact soils made of sand, salt, and clay. We have hot, hot, humid temperature climate in summer with significant temperature variation um, 
um, late in August and early September. And winter really, really humid without significant cha change because it's humid in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the night. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the healthy, the perfect healthy climate. <laughs> We have to fight the elements um, uh, most of the time. Um, can you touch on that white thing that we see, that fork that we see in the vineyard? Um, these uh, are uh, the crepe that we um, that we used after uh, the harvest and uh, after uh, the work in the cellar. You use uh, we use the skin. Um, that uh, remain after uh, um, after having uh, done the um, the mast and the wine, and we use uh, um, we use them uh, on the ground because they they give uh, uh, mineral and humus for the ground. So it's really important to. Um, um, to use everything natural for the health of our uh, land. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you're returning the organic matter back to the soil. And what about that white uh, device that's in the background? Uh, this is a meteorological uh, um... sensor. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Um, it uh, it's really important uh, for um, for the prevention and the use of the copper and the sulfur because uh, uh, it analyzes the humidity of the leaf uh, in the vineyard and the climate on the vineyard, and so it tells us perfectly when we have to use copper and sulfur and it's really important because in this way we can re we, we reduce um, a, a lot a lot uh, the use of sulfur and copper right um, so the meteorological station helps you reduce um, your your um, pesticides or uh, agrochemical uh, input, which is very important if you uh, want to make a natural wine, especially with copper being a neurotoxin. Um, so um, let's go off to the varieties of Lambrusco. So we have, uh, we have several sources. Uh, I believe the Oxford Companion to Wine mentions um, or Jensen's Robinson site mentions that there's 13 different varieties with Lambrusco in their name and 60 sub varieties. Um, Sheila found another source that says 17 different varieties of Lambrusco. So there's, there's obvi obviously a plurality of varieties. Um, so tell us a little bit how we can distinguish them um, and let's illustrate with uh, tasting them. And by the way, for those that have purchased uh, some of the wines before the tastings. Uh, today, we are tasting the Rosso Matilde. Yes. Uh, we, are, we are tasting the uh, Chambala. Yes. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes. Um, and we, <laughs> thank you. The emphasis on the last syllable and the Essencia. Um, yes. So um, if you have these bottles on you, feel free to pour yourself a glass and spend the rest of our uh, talk uh, sipping on these wines while we talk about these varieties. Um, so um, one thing, yeah, absolutely. So tell us about the Lambrusco variety and how we can distinguish between uh, all these varieties that have basically the same first name. Um, first of all, uh, uh, we have to distinguish the varieties that are used just uh, in um, Emilia uh, that are Sorbara and Grasparossa. We, we, um, this type, these varieties are used just for Emilia and Lambrusco. Then all the other varieties can be used both in Emilia Romagna and in Lombardy. Uh, the differences come from um, the climate and the soil because um, 
it depends if the vineyards are close to a river or uh, close to a little lake or uh, on the hill or on the plain. The same varieties can be uh, really different from um, a Lombardy um, vineyard to an Emilian uh, to an Emilian vineyard. So um, the soil and the climate make the difference. Mm -hmm. And here, um, Sheila has a photo of uh, uh, Salamino grape. Uh, Salamino uh, grape is the most famous variety uh, to make Lambrusco, um, both in Lombardy and uh, in Emilia. And it's the variety we use the most uh, in this moment. It has marked flavors and great acidity with biting scents. It has small cylindrical cluster with compact density, as you, as you can see. It has a thick peel with a dark blue violet color. And Salamino is really, really famous for its tannins. It's a fantastic grape. As, as you can really taste the tannins and the Rosso Matilde that Sheila put um, conveniently on the screen. Um, and um, it, when I'm looking at the text sheet of Rosso Matilde, um, it says that it's a blend of Lambrusco Salamino, which you just um, described, and Ancelotta. Uh, we don't see yeah. Ancelotta on the labels that often. Can you, describe, um, can you describe the variety? Can you tell us about it? Yes, uh, Angelotta is always a dark red <laughs> grape. Uh, it has few scents uh, in respect of Salamino, but it's rich of Antochanis. Uh, in the past, the farmers had different varieties of, um, of grape uh, in uh, their vines, and they used to, to mix all the variety to make uh, um, to make Lambrusco. Uh, Angelotta was very important uh, to give color, structure, and sugar content uh, to the wine. Um, in effect, uh, Angelotta and Rosso Matilde give uh, a, soft state, a soft taste and a high, um, and a sugar level higher than Ciamballà. Uh, that is the, um, the wine that you will going to taste later. Uh, why it's important, Ancelotta? Uh, with Ancelotta, we can gain an important alcoholic fermentation, uh, having a natural sugar residual. And, and this is really, really important because we don't use any addiction of sugar um, and we use only the sugar of our grape, that is Ancelotta. So for a, a natural and an artisan wine, um, use only the grape and the substances that you can have from your grape is, is fundamental, is the base. Um, Ancelotta, I think, that covers a little bit the perfume of... Um, um, of Salamino and, and the acidity of Salamino, but it gives equilibrium to the wine and a fulfilled body sensation. Um, I make you an example. Um, we know that one of the most addiction in the world is sugar, you know? <laughs> and, uh, because I am guilty of that addiction too. Yeah. Okay, me too, me too, to, to chocolate, but now we're speaking about wine, so <laughs> let's continue to speak about Rosso Matilde. And um, because it, it's pleasing and, and satisfying, uh, Rosso Matilde with its natural sugar residual is the Lambrusco that everyone agree. Right. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Um, you have uh, made this Rosso Matilde uh, with Charmat method. 
and you have also made the chambala uh with yes. method. Um, yeah so um i would like to compare these two wines to your essentia uh which is made col fondo so um on the lees um can you talk about the differences between these two methods and uh, for now, just illustrate between Matilde, if you can uh, pour yourself a glass of Matilde and pour yourself a glass of Essencia and kind of tell um, what, the, what the main differences are there based on method of production. And then we can try the Champala. Uh, the, the, um, the difference between these uh, two methods is the position of uh, the second fermentation, because uh, in Sharma method, the second fermentation is in the autoclave, and for a fermented in bottle like Stensia, uh, the second fermentation is in the bottle. Um, I want to, to, um, to explain you a thing about Sharma method. Um, Lambrusco winemaker in the 70s used, um, used to use uh, Sharma method because uh, um, this meat, because the wine is ready forced. After um, five, 10, 15 days in the autoclave, uh, the wine is ready. So, uh, if we think that um, conventional Lambrusco produce um, million of million of bottles, it's very important to, uh, to make the process of production really, really faster. Okay, so this is why the most of Lambrusco is produced with Sharma method. We use Sharma method, but uh, for another reason. Um, it's for us, uh, according to us, it's the ideal method to obtain fruity and fresh wine. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosso Matilde stay in the autoclave for a month. Chambala stay in the autoclave 10 months. So we are speaking about month <laughs> and not about days. This is uh, the great difference. Our fermentation are much more longer than uh, conventional Lambrusco. Uh, we make a pied de coup with the wine and its must, so with the yields and its sugar. And then we put uh, the wine and the pied de coup inside the autoclave and we leave them there to mouth. After two months, we remove uh, the yeast and we leave the wine in the autoclave. Um, this is uh, really, really important because we are looking for a fresh and fruity wine. Uh, the bubble, the bubble uh, with a long fermentation in the autoclave is really thin and, pers and persistent. Now you are opening these bottles, okay? If you close the bottles with the right cork and you open the bottle um, in two or three days, the bubble is the same, doesn't change. If you drink a conventional wine with uh, five, 10 days in the autoclave, you have great bubble in your, uh, in your glass when you open, when you just open the bottle, but after one hour, the bubble changes. So a long and natural fermentation is, is really important to maintain uh, the right effervescence. So this is a Sharma method. In Essencia, uh, we put the wine into the seal with the mast and uh, we, we mix and then after 30 minutes we go uh, to the bottle. In this way, uh, we have a more complex wine. Um, first of all, Essencia stay in the bottle uh, one year before being sold. 
So uh, we, we give to the East uh, all the time to express them with, um, with the wine. So if Charmamitut is much more fruity and fresh, um, fermented in bottle is much more dry and mineral. But it's the real expression of, uh, of the wine. Absolutely. And um, I just have to um, support what you have said because I've opened these bottles um, about an hour and 15 minutes ago and I can already uh, feel the difference in texture between Rosso Matilde and Essencia where the bubbles uh, were, you know, very persistent in the beginning, <coughs> uh, but now they're really fine uh, almost like fine tuned, fine grain, very subtle on the Matilde, as made with Charmant method. But Essencia is maintaining um, its uh, its uh, spark uh, sparkle. So um, that's a very interesting point that it changes. Um, it can change on you so fast. Um, so let's let's. Uh, uh, look at Chambala for, for just a second. It is made with the same method as Rosso Matilde, um, but it is 100% Lambrusco Salam. You know, the first thing that I, you know, appeared to me when I tasted the wine uh, was, um, wow, so much acidity, it's so fresh. Um, can you can you just touch on um, touch on Chambala and what do you get uh, from this wine? Uh, Chambala uh, has the same vine of Essencia, okay, so they, they are brother, okay, from Chambala we wanted, um, we wanted floral notes and, uh, and that open to a fruit mix, we wanted the right mix uh, of perfume, tannins and acidity. And we, we could obtain this with, uh, with the longer fermentation that allow us to, um, to, maxim, um, to, sorry, my husband is looking at me and it is, is laughing because <laughs> I can't find <laughs> the words. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that uh, with Chambala we wanted to to, uh, to find the maximum expression of the features of Salamino, and the feature of Salamino is acidity. Okay, so uh, we 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 were looking for this for Chambala. Um, you are tasting uh, the um, 2018 of uh, Chambala and um, that uh, it's uh, in the bottle since uh, two years and uh, in, it's perfect, it's perfect. I opened the bottle of Chambala yesterday and uh, this is another thing to, to, uh, to explain. Uh, people think that Lambrusco uh, must be drunk uh, in uh, six months after that uh, it is bottled. Mm -hmm. This is not true. This is true maybe for conventional wine, but if uh, we are speaking about, about artisan uh, or natural wine, uh, their, uh, their lives uh, are uh, longer and the most uh, the wine stay in the bottle the most uh, its features uh, improve mm -hmm. for the charme for the charma method and obviously the life is shorter uh, for essencia that is a fermented bottle uh, with the yeast we are speaking about live wine always involving and always improving so it's a it's a bottle that you can buy and um, you you drink today then you drink another bottle uh, in uh, one month then another month another bottle in uh, three months and you can taste and uh, and see the difference and the changing of the wine 
Essentia is a live wine. I, I always say when you drink Essentia, you have, you have to stop because Essentia is um, a Lambrusco that, that has a, a great story to, um, uh, to um, I don't find the word <laughs> to, 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 to talk. And you have to, to, to drink uh, a, a glass of the Essencia, Essencia and listen in your mouth what Essencia has to, uh, to told you. So it's a, it's a great wine. Now that I'm tasting across your lineup, um, even though the wines come from two different vintages, so Matilda that I have is uh, 2019, and the Chambala and Essencia, as you said, were uh, 2018. Um, and there's, um, you know, the, the wines each have their own personality, um, but yet you could see the common thread uh, between all three wines. Uh, you can see that they're all really structured. That's something that um, actually is really hard for me to find in these industrial Lambruscos. Um, it has, um, you know, it has a very vibrant, juicy acidity. It has a lot of, uh, a lot of tannin um, that is um, kind of holding the shape of the wine. But the wine, all the wines have this beautiful floral element as well. I think it's, it's, um, reminds me of hibiscus tea, the carcade that they make in Egypt. Um, like this macerated rose petal. Uh, so it's this rare combination of, of structure and power. And then you also have this very floral, very feminine element. It's almost like a collaboration between a man and a woman that are making the wines. Yes, yes, yes. Um... The, the feminine components, uh, I, I speak about feminine components because you, you told and uh, um, our farm uh, has a great uh, feminine components because first of all, uh, it's me that it's always speaking, okay? You know, we are a couple, so he does and I speak, but in every, such in every couple, is the woman that, <laughs> that could use the, the, <laughs> the meaning, okay, and... Uh, uh, Giuseppe just said something, what did he say? C'è sempre l'ignorantello della famiglia, ci la traduci. No, dai. <laughs> and... Uh, um, all, uh, all uh, our um, three Lambrusco has the name of a woman. Rosso Matilde mm -hmm. was a great uh, countess, uh, lived in the Middle Age in our village, and she was uh, the first one to, to um, think about the potential of the Lambrusco plant that was a wide plant. And she told it to the friar to start uh, cultivate this uh, this plant and start producing a wine. So uh, Rosso Matilde is dedicated to her. So this wine is for a family, for, for a woman. Yay. Yeah, yeah, good power, always good. <laughs> and Chambala is, is the nickname uh, of, uh, of our daughter, Greta. So another, another wine dedicated to... Now, now she, is, uh, she is little because she's seven years old, uh, but she has a great, great uh, potential, I think. And uh, I really hope that she will be a great woman like Chambala is a great wine. Amore. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that Junio Martino is a love story. <laughs> it's always a love story. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, does Chambala mean anything? Chambala. Uh, Chambala is uh, it's, it's difficult. When, when Greta was born, she has Chambella. Okay, I don't know how you translate in English. Uh, like a donut or pound? Okay, like a donut yeah. on the stomach. She, she was she was a little bit fat. Okay. 
<laughs> and and she used to call her Chambala. Mm. And this is why we, we when we pr start producing uh, our second wine, uh, we, we decided to give her nickname to our wine. Mm. That makes total sense. So while we're at the wines, uh, let's start talking about the food. It's uh, it's almost lunchtime here in California. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, uh, dinner late dinner time in Italy right now. Um, so as we're sipping on these wines, uh, what type of cuisine could uh, complement them well? Uh, Lambrusco is perfect with meat. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I told you that in Mantova uh, there is a legend. I don't know if it, it is a legend or not, but in Mantova, we everyone here says that we have a seven pig per, per person. Okay, so uh, uh, pigs per person. I just want to read. Yeah, seven <laughs> pigs per person. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the most, uh, one of the most uh, um, famous food here is salame mantovano and, um, and, uh, and so uh, it's perfect with meat, but in the same time you can use uh, Rosso Matilde as aperitif or with light food, uh, oh. I don't know. If you, uh, if you like healthy food, healthy cuisine, and um, simple food uh, like um, uh, rice, vegetables. Bravissima! Um, <laughs> Ciao Antonella! <laughs> and um, uh, it's, uh, it's perfect because Lambrusco is... Uh, is uh, a type of wine that uh, uh, is for food pairing, okay? But it's not um, a difficult wine. It's a, an easy wine because it's um, uh, the, the alcohol is not uh, is not so high, okay? Uh, and uh, you can drink um, a, a glass. Maybe if you want to drink a bottle of Lambrusco, there is no problem. But if you want to drink a glass of Lambrusco, uh, it's not a, a, a type of wine that makes you difficult to, to approach uh, <laughs> the day and, uh, and the work. Uh, when I describe Lambrusco um, as a person, I say that uh, Lambrusco is uh, that type of wine that you can... Uh, uh, it's like a friend uh, uh, that you call when you want to have a party to go out uh, and uh, and uh, laugh and be happy with no problem. So this is Lambrusco. Lambrusco has never problem. Okay, so it's uh, it's this type of wine that you can drink uh, in in different moment. But it's this type of uh, of person and friend that I, I don't know maybe maybe uh, I'm the only smoker in uh, in this moment but I smoke and <laughs> when you when you go out in the night not with coronavirus but may, um, I hope the coronavirus uh, will finish sooner or later and and you you make uh, a party and you go out or you go to the restaurant you go to the pub and you finish the night with the last cigarette okay and everyone is tired and usually uh, my friend I don't know if my friends are strange but I have this type of strain of friends and um, usually um, the person that is um, much um, I don't. I don't want to know stupid, but uh, easier. Uh, when start to think uh, to to talk, uh, um, talk about serious things, uh, uh, important things, uh, speak about values, and 
this is the same for Lambrusco. It's a happy wine, but uh, if you stop and listen to him, to it, Lambrusco has um, a lot of things to, to talk about, but you don't have uh, the, um, the, um, the, you don't um, stop. I can't find the word. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I think what you're trying to imply and what resonates with me is that no wine style or category is big or small yeah. enough um, to not be consequential in terms of its philosophy and how it treats the earth um, and how the wine is produced. Um, and that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, while uh, we really admire the amount of charcuterie that you can have um, in Mantova, um, let's talk about uh, dishes that you could pair uh, with Lambrusco and specifically with your wines um, here in America. Is there anything in traditional American uh, cuisine that you could pair with these wines? Well, um... With Thanksgiving around the corner? Yes. <laughs> yes, Thanksgiving. This is a, a very, uh, it's sort of like a crowd pleaser, I find. Um, it's, they're, they're great wines, um, lower in alcohol. Um, because the tannins are lower, um, the um, it, white wine drinkers will, will tend to like Lambrusco. You know, if, if white wine drinkers tend to avoid red wine, they, they tend to like Lambrusco. And then, you know, it is of course a red wine. So please the red wine drinkers as well. Uh, you know, it's different for a typical American, let's say red wine drinker, because it doesn't have the, you know, the tannins, let's say uh, maybe the um, sort of the, um, <coughs> Uh, what's the word? Uh, sort of the um, the more the hangover. <laughs> the hangover. <laughs> I want to say that that sort of you know it has flavor, but uh, Amer American uh, red wines tend to be um, I would say a bit of more heavy and almost like syrupy. Let's say mm -hmm. uh, so. It, it is a different wine. Let's say for that a, a typical American you know red, red wine drinker um would you know would like but uh but i think it would pair with a lot of the um you know a lot of the foods that we have at thanksgiving absolutely um i think this would go fantastic uh with that turkey and cranberry um cranberry sauce um i was thinking about would, would be a really great pairing um for the vegetarians out there i i feel like you don't really have to be worried about um, any um, any food combinations because a lot of vegetarian foods are naturally uh, slightly higher in acidity, but these wines have plenty of it. So whether you are eating the pizza margarita or you're having your crudite plate, I think uh, all of those uh, would go great with these wines. Um, I, I feel like we've almost done like a uh, 200 degrees of Lambrusco and I would like to uh, finish on your farm um, and um, and give it some thoughts. So you have mentioned in the beginning that you've planted, you've started planting the vineyards about uh, 15 years ago um, and you have started farming organically almost immediately. So um, I'm interested in what improvements were necessary to bring it to the current state. Uh, uh, the first thing was to revitalize the land, mm -hmm. uh, to recreate life uh, in the soil, which is not the case with conventional agriculture. Uh, that use weeding mineral fertilizers and insecticides. Um, with conventional agriculture, soils are very productive in the short term, but uh, very poor in substances in the long term. Instead, natural land 
are balanced terrains that remain always balanced. And this is really, really important because if you make a natural warrant, you, you don't be in a hurry. You, you have to wait. And in natural agriculture, we use cultural rotation with a specific culture, uh, such as green manures. Manures, mm -hmm. you, you say, Sheila Sovesho. Cosa? Green manures. Manures? Man manures. Manures, okay, okay. Uh, they're really important because they re restructure the land and make them more aerated and uh, more air and more oxygen means uh, less water stagnation and help uh, uh, to, the, um, to the formation of natural vegetables humus. humus. Is this, for example, Raffaella, how you use the, um, the pumice to fertilize? Can you utilize the luva per... No, 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 no. Uh, no. Uh, manure is another thing. It's, um, it's, uh, it's like uh, if, you, if you plant uh, herbs, okay, uh, that grow. Uh, it's a compost, uh, it's uh, herbs. Uh, um, it, it's very technical, these things. Yeah, I don't uh, know, Len Lenka, if you're familiar with this, you might be. Um, I, I, I wonder if you're uh, referring to a mixed compost that, um, you know, has a mix of green parts and dry parts that you use to fertilize the soil, like high organic matter content? No, 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 no. Um, green manure are, um, are a type of, uh, of um, herbs that you put uh, in, the, um, in the land that grow. You cut the herbs and the type of herbs that you planted are full of property uh, to for uh, for the for the ground. So it's a it's a, a studied things and are um, the right the right uh, herbs and the right grass that you that you plant. Well, I wonder if these are um, the sort of nitrogen fixers, which in America we are using a lot of um, legumes um, yeah, to do legumes. that. So while, while they're in their growing cycle, they can fix um, um, nitrogen in the soil and, um, you know, uh, capture a lot of, uh, a lot of carbon uh, in their bodies. And then uh, when you tuck them into the soil, they are able to track, uh, trap some of that carbon and um, atmospheric nitrogen into the soil and, and be a source of nutrition for the vines. Yeah, yeah. Clover is used a lot here. Clover. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, often we're using legumes or uh, brassica families also used depending on what your goal is. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah, so really so really it. Uh, what else are you? Um, what else are you growing on the farm besides uh, the cover crops and the green manures? Um, do you have any other? fruits or vegetables? Do you have any other farm animals besides the pigs per person? Oh, yes, because... Um, <laughs> allora, um, we have ancient grains, sunflower, uh, soybean, corn, alfalfa for uh, parmesan, because we are the first village where we can produce parmigiano-reggiano. Uh, field bean. Uh, we have a lot of animals. We have horse, uh, pheasants, wild duck, foxes, and maybe, maybe in the next month, uh, uh, geez, geezy, uh, which are really important to, to create a small ecosystem uh, where everything works. Uh, we use um, 
also also for uh, uh, this idea of creating a small ecosystem we use biodynamic preparation such as manure horn uh, silica horn and uh, for the ground for uh, uh, not only for the vineyard but uh, in all the 70 hectares of the farm uh, we we eliminate those tillage from the soils that overturn the skeleton of the soil like plowing mm -hmm. and we use only equipment that work the soil vertically and this is really really important for uh, uh, for uh, the mineral inside uh, the ground um, we uh, our idea is to create uh, uh, an ecosystem and um, that continue to work uh, to to work together this is why animals and vegetables have to work together and the ground has to be live it's really really important um i make you i make you an example we don't use pesticide uh, not even natural ones we fight uh, harmful insects with biodiversity that attracts uh, predator insects mm -hmm. For example, if you know if you know the moth, uh, it's um, it's a very dangerous insect for the vine. We use the laces of sexual sexual confusion, mm -hmm. and um, the moth works uh, in pair, uh, male and female, and these laces confuse the male. Like, like for people, it's the same things. Who <laughs> not finding uh, the female does not reproduce. Um, with, uh, with the green manure that are based on grasses and legumes, and uh, with the multifloral green manures, we attract uh, the good insects uh, such as ladybugs, uh, bees, hummingbirds, and um, they are really important to create this small ecosystem uh, where everything works. Uh, nature is self-sustaining and must be complete to function. So this is our idea. Absolutely, and this is the thought that I coincidentally get a uh, second time this week after visiting uh, Ted Lemon at Literary Wines. Um, he also practices biodynamics and this focus on diversity and um, the notion that the stable systems are uh, the systems that are diverse um, because uh, when you have uh, removed or reduced um, a very rich system into only um, you know, into only the bare soil and the vine, then they're naturally more prone to disease. So thank you for explaining some of these mechanisms that um, you are using. And um, I also wanted to ask you if you could summarize why organic farming is, do you think is important for you and maybe for everyone? Um, and then if we have one minute, maybe we can take a question. Uh, we we go beyond organic. Um, it is it, it is not important. Is fundamental to be self sustainable. Uh, it, I think it's a question of respect uh, for ourselves, for the others, and for nature, and for the future. Uh, we are what we drink and what we eat. Uh, so um, feel safe to drink our Lambrusco from Bugno Martino because uh, uh, it's, it's made with, uh, with nature and with love. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Raffaella, and thank you so much, Giuseppe. Uh, Sheila, do we have any questions that we can answer really fast? 
Um, not at the moment. Um, I wanted just to, uh, anyone um, interested in uh, like unmuting yourself, um, feel free. We, we have a number of people, um, pretty much everyone that works in, the, in trade in some way or form um, that are part of the Zoom. Some are in California and some on the East Coast. Um, so if someone wants just to unmute and ask a question or just make a comment, say hi, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> all right. Um, I just, can you, you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, so I, I'd like to uh, ask, it sounds like you're going down the biodynamic route with the vineyard. Is that something that you're hoping to establish or you're just doing it because you want to be good farmers? Uh, mm, we, we didn't approach the biodynamic method because we wanted to, to, to gain a uh, certification. Uh, we, um, for an uh, artisan winemaker, um, the, the things that uh, you do in, in the vineyard and uh, in, uh, in the cellar uh, come from a philosophy. So um, we, 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 we believe that biodynamic, some, some, uh, um, some, some working of, uh, of um, biodynamic is really, really important to give structure and fitness to, um, to the ground. So we, uh, we don't, uh, we, um, we are not biodynamic at all, but we are moving on this road because uh, we think that it's, it's, a, it's an healthy road. Yeah, undoubtedly, and it makes better wines. Yeah, <laughs> we hope. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> no you have, well, you said you started in the vineyard. If the wine starts in the vineyard and the vineyard is healthy, then the wine is going to be much more interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, the wine starts in the vineyard, but uh, it, it, is not, uh, it is not the only thing because uh, I think that uh, in, um, in the next years, uh, also, the great companies um, arrive to obtain a high quality uh, grape because uh, there is a great attention on these things. Uh, I, saw, I saw that some great company started to produce uh, organic wine with no sulfite wine. So, uh, the difference uh, between uh, uh, the wine that come from the great company and the artisan winery is the hand of the winemaking. That is. I <laughs> 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 don't understand anything. So. <laughs> and uh, and the artisan work that uh, he he does in the cellar is. Uh, is the different. Uh, the grapes are really, really important, but uh, the work of the artisan winemaker in the cellar is the same important like the grape. I think this is a great difference. But I think, yeah, and I, I think undoubted, yes, the winemaker is as important. And when people say natural wine, you know, little intervention, the wine doesn't get made by itself. Somebody has yeah. to make decisions that affect the product that you drink. So, of course, it, what you do in the winery and, and the madman or the mad woman in the, in the winery putting together, that's, right? It's the director yeah. directing the film. Yes, exactly, exactly. You, you have to uh, recognize uh, the, um, the philosophy of the vigneron because the wine is, Every, every vintage of Bugno Martino is different, also for the same label, okay? But um, if, you, if you taste a different vintage, uh, one after the other, uh, you can recognize 
uh, our uh, our sign. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's now it's looking, <laughs> and it's his sign. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> And I don't think, um, Lenka, we mentioned about, we talked about Grappello uh, Ruberti. Uh, we have not mentioned this variety, and I, and I um, remember that uh, Rafaela was uh, talking about it uh, last week. Uh, do yeah. you want to touch on the variety? Um, and also, like, uh, when I've seen the Lambrusco Salamino and I've seen how compact the cluster were, um, you know, this is this is kind of uh, the first thing that you notice on that Grappello Ruperti, how loose the cluster is. And when you think about the humidity in your region, it actually may be uh, really suitable uh, because I would assume it has less uh, fungal issues, less mildew uh, problems. I am. Um, and Rafael, I voice spiegare un po' cos'è Rappello Ruberti. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yes, you, you made a terrible photo, uh, she loved. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I took this right after they harvested. Uh, because because yeah. you, you came when the when the harvest was finished to see right, yes, yeah. <laughs> because Grappello Roberti is a is a is a fantastic grape. First of all, uh, it's uh, the only Mantuan autochthonous grape. This is really, really important. Um, you can find Grappello Roberti just in our village, San Benedetto Po. Uh, it's an old vine clone that existed in, in the past and uh, it was abandoned uh, because it can't stand the high yields. So in the 70s and in the 80s, um, winemaker uh, must produce a lot of Lombrusco, so Grappello Ruberti was not perfect, uh, the perfect vine for the great production. We recovered it because um, we believe that it's a great, great vine. Um, and in 2013, it has been recognized from the, um, by the agriculture minister. So we have, uh, we have a doc. And Grappello Ruberti is our new project. Uh, the plants uh, have uh, have six years. We we never make uh, made a wine with uh, this vine because uh, uh, it was too young to produce wine for us. And um, uh, this is the new project because we are working on a very, very natural wine. We, we, we are not using uh, temperature control for this wine and uh, we will make a fermented in bottle. And um, it's our first vintage, uh, 2020. And um, we made uh, two, 20 days of macerations and we have to wait next year <laughs> to taste because we, we have to wait uh, a little bit. And uh, Grappello Ruberti is a, is a wild, uh, it's a wild plant, but the different, uh, the difference uh, with um, other varieties of Lambrusco is that uh, um, it's uh, in the end, in the mouth, it's really, really elegant. So um, it's, it's a great mix of, uh, of wild and elegance. Thank you so much, Rafaela. Um, and with that, Sheila, um, thank you for, uh, for the reminder um, about this ancient variety because um, 
I, I feel like there's invaluable work in reviving these ancient varieties and you know maybe even vineyards that have been forgotten for a long time. Um, thank you so much, Rafaela, and uh, thank you so much, Giuseppe, for all of your time. Uh, Sheila, thank you for thank you. Uh, the graceful in introduction. And I would pass the word to you if you have any concluding comments. Uh, just to uh, everyone um, who, wh whether you're on the Zoom or Facebook Live or you hear recording session, uh, please do uh, reach out to us if you work in the trade and are interested in, um, in sampling. Uh, you can go to our website, verovinogusto.com or email us at verovinogusto at gmail.com. And for consumers, we, um, we sell these wines uh, online as well. Uh, they're great for, as we said, for Thanksgiving, but also for really any occasion. And um, so again, go to veravinogusto.com. And thanks so much, Lenka. This was really uh, interesting. And um, you know, you really uh, kind of brought out different aspects that, um, you know, that let's say, you know, I wouldn't have thought to ask and, and I learned a lot. And thank you, Giuseppe and Raffaella. Thank you. Thank you so much for the hand of the winemaker too. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone uh, participating. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving. Pleasure to talk Happy to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a nice day. Thanksgiving. Talk yeah. to you later, Sheila. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao. 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 Bye.